This is Dave Meltzer with Entrepreneur of the Playbook, and I am so excited. I got the dynamic duo. We were sharing Jewish geography here from Boston uh, with Made in Cookware. We're talking about real entrepreneurs, multi-million dollar business, two childhood friends, and let's go way back. When you guys met at five years old, what was your dream? <laughs> I think uh, I always wanted to be an astronaut. Um, this is Chip speaking, and yeah, sorry, um, yeah, and we Chip Malt and J Jake Kalick, by the way. Sorry about that. Absolutely, and I think uh, you know when you're five, it's not your choice to meet, but our parents put us in the same preschool together, and um, you know we end up I think fighting all through preschool, and that's how we knew we were going to be best friends forever. <laughs> he was Chip was very good at math. I remember, so I think it makes a lot of sense that he. Is the analytical one in the partnership and and saw a lot of opportunity there yeah i do i do remember middle we went to middle school together and then high school and um jake went to a either a jimmy buffett concert or some I don't know. some was... concert um in high school and he came in the next morning and we were in a class together a science class and it was a complete math related test and i take my test i look over he's sitting there and he's com she is completely blank and he's staring at it with a uh, blank face and I was just like hey man I need to help you out with this um, and that was I think the beginning the beginning of the uh, the partnership from so there. So now BBNN and Cambridge Mass knows I cheated my way through high school. <laughs> well look, you, and, you and I both sit in the same uh, school then. So there you go. It worked, it worked for me man I learned morals later on. Right? <laughs> uh, but it got me through high school right? Yeah of course. So did other thinks. things that don't work after high school either. <laughs> um, anyway as you move forward what, so were you guys best friends by junior high school or wh when did you become really close? Yeah, our, our best group of friends is really our, our high school friends. So we have a real core group. Um, it was a small school, 110 graduating class. And, um, you know, we still see those uh, boys and girls every every week or so. So, and, and did you guys have any business ventures when you were in high school? We actually did. We uh, When we were, I think, 12 or something, tried to create a DJ company where we um, spun for like bar mitzvahs and, and like middle school dances. And, and it was funny at that point, we made our own business, uh, business cards and we printed out cardboard piece of paper and then slapped on and taped like DJ by Jake and Chip. Yep. We didn't get too many clients, but it was, uh, did either of you rap or beatbox or uh, anything? Probably with the embarrassingly DJ side? so. I think like any Jewish teenager, you go through that phase where you exactly. think you could be a rapper or a professional Thanks athlete. to the Beastie Boys, right? Yeah, yeah. Exactly. exactly. I was, I rap too, so don't yeah, feel there bad. There you go. Maybe yeah. we can freestyle and my, co my cousin who went to BU actually ended up being a big DJ, DJ Wooly in New York oh, wow. and uh, was in Stomp, really good. But anyway, so you guys had an entrepreneurial spirit, but you both were really good students, right? Um, you know, Chip, you went to- To Georgetown. Georgetown, Georgetown and, and then, then Berkeley. Berkeley Business School. Yep. And Cornell. Correct. Uh, hospitality, which yeah. is top in the nation. Exactly. Um, and so it's really good compliment as well uh, for what you do. And how did you piece together, and I assume made in cookware is your first business? Yeah, so um, I was a computer science major at Georgetown, so kind of always had that tech side of things in my blood. Um, and after that, went to Wall Street, and you know that's just the thing you do a lot of times in the Northeast is like the top of the class goes to Wall Street, and you kind of have this cookie cutter life set out for you. And quickly realized that wasn't for me at all. You know, it's very uh, you're working with really smart people, really driven people. It's uh, intense environment, but um, not really that entre entrepreneurial spirit that you're talking about. It was very formulaic. Um, each day was kind of the same plus or minus, um, you know, some variance. And um, so left there, went back to Berkeley, as you mentioned, and um, took a lot of my business school classes actually at the um, engineering school. So the computer science and data science um, departments. And for me, like that's what's exciting is that's like the forefront of what's happening right now, the um, probably the fastest growing part of the, the industry right now. And so went back and ran um, e-commerce for an apparel company, a sports apparel company called Roan um, for three or four years and cut my chops on what it meant to grow a digital brand and had the idea for Made In and reached out to Jake, whose family history is in that space and said, hey, you know, I think we can grow a, a digital brand in the kitchen space, which hasn't been done before, but I know absolutely nothing about product, which is really the most important thing at the end of the day. Um, I know I can sell it. I know I can build the website, all that, but like, can you help me with the product? And um, gave him a call and from day one, we were off and running. Yeah. And you went to hospitality school because your family was in that business. Yeah, yeah. My, my family has had a business in wholesaling of restaurant equipment and supplies for about 100 years. Um, oh. And I grew up like watching my dad, who was an entrepreneur, kind of play by his own rules and build his own businesses. So I knew I wanted to be in hospitality and around restaurants because it's all I ever really knew. Um, studied hospitality, worked in fine dining consulting in New York City um, for some pretty cool chefs and restaurateurs and then went home and you know, took my stab at the family business. Uh, put my five years in, which is what I said I would do, and then um, was kind of looking for my next move because as much as I loved working with the family, um, 
it was wholesale, so I didn't feel like it was our brand, right? You're, you're buying other right. people's brands and turning around and selling it um, and wanted to build something that was kind of my own. So when Chip reached out, it was kind of the perfect timing, and we got together, took our different skill sets, and built the brand. So, you know, I have a rule about partnerships. Number one, don't get into a partnership. Two, if you're going to, make sure your partner has more money than you. <laughs> and three, if you don't listen to rule one or two, then go back to rule one. Um, <laughs> anyway, in this partnership, the parental influence that you have, obviously, I know hyper academic kids and growing up in the type of schools that you went back in the Northeast, which is entirely different than the South or the West. Uh, you know, I find a lot of kids fall and almost ruin their lives by putting faith in what their parents want for them, right? We, we take advice from the people that we love you, then we resent them for it. And Chip, it sounds like, you know, you had more of a traditional uh, background and you had to leave Wall Street. Uh, number one, what were the pressures that you had from family and friends? And then two, when you went to Jake, obviously Jake comes from a different background and you were looking for that, but was Jake in assistance uh, or did it help your credibility within that pressure to go ahead and break off and say, hey, I may be entrepreneurial, but you know, I've known Jake since the fifth grade. They're in this business. You know, there's more stability than some guy just coming up with a made-in cookware brand. Yeah. Um, so for me, I mean, I don't think there was parental pressure so much as, I mean, my, I think so my dad's dad was a doctor. My dad was a lawyer. Um, there was some pressure just to do something great. But I think the pressure was more um, doing it for the wrong reasons coming out of school. So, you know, Wall Street at Georgetown was like where all the best, uh, most coveted jobs were. And it was more proving it to classmates, you know, that you were at the top of the class as opposed to what I actually wanted to do. And that's what I realized pretty quickly was, hey, like th I did this for the wrong reasons. I want to get out um, in terms of starting made in. And your parents were okay with that. Absolutely. Yeah, um, and, you know, I think going to, to Berkeley and um, just like, you know, all that stuff helped in it. But um, in terms of starting made in, you know, I think it was really a, a uh, educational compliment th to have Jake there. And obviously starting a business with your friend, as you said, is, might not be uh, against one of your rules. Um, but one, like, I mean, everything from the fundraising process, which sucks. You're looking uh, at a guy who has a partner with his best friend too, yeah, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, I don't lose my own rules. I'm just telling you the just rules. Telling, I right? rules. Exactly. My yeah, dad told me that rule. I, I know. And, and I mean, especially like even from the fundraise, pr fundraise process from day one where we're going out and having 90, 90 no's looking for that one yes. You know, those are trying times and having someone there that's not just a hired gun or someone that came to you with an idea, but someone who you can sit down and have a beer with and not talk about work at all was, was yeah. really helpful. Absolutely. And Jake, on your side, was there any trepidation about working with someone that kind of had the more formal computer, you know, <clears throat> Wall Street background? No, I mean, I think it was really interesting. I, I grew up in, in a really old school industry with an uh, kind of old school family business. So I think it was something that always intrigued me is like, all right, what do we do if we, you know, take the MBA approach and raise private equity money from the start and, you know, don't own 100 percent of the business and and take that approach. So. I think it's great. I mean, Chip and I have incredibly different skill sets. And, and when people ask about working with a best friend, I said, if we had the same skill sets or the same kind of personalities, I think we would have probably failed by now. Um, yeah. But because we're true so about marriage too. Just <laughs> I know we get to the real life stuff. Like yeah. that's why my wife and I have been married almost 22 years now is that if we were the same, like we would drive each other crazy. But all the strengths are weaknesses and the weaknesses are strengths. Yeah, and I think that's definitely the case for us and it's very much married. I mean, we're two young male founders. I think some people think we might be married. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> we're yeah. not. <laughs> um, it's but okay if you are, no, hey, all yeah, over but now. believe me, yeah, yeah, but uh, we've got enough shit stuff going on. <laughs> <Right>? so, uh, <laughs> but yeah, so that said, I think we, we complement each other well and we let each other do our thing and stay in our lanes. So raising money is another issue for entrepreneurs yep. and when to raise money is critical and how did you guys go about funding your business? So we each uh, put in uh, a, a certain amount. Before. Equal amount. Yeah, equal yeah. amount before. I think it was something when you talk about like giving up the, the relationship from day one and setting those boundaries as friends, you know, we were cognizant of the fact that our, we had a friendship first and that business second. And so um, we created like those uh, partnership agreements before we even started with equity breakouts, st stuff that we've seen gone wrong mm -hmm. in other businesses. And what type of entity did you do a uh, We started as an LLC and then moved to an incorporation. And did you we... split it 50-50? Exactly. Correct. Okay. And it was uh, a nominal check we started with. Yeah, that's Very okay. Nominal, but I yeah. think it's important for entrepreneurs to know that, right? They're all wondering, what do I do? A lot of people 
start with a partner and nobody gets to these questions ever and this is about the playbook so good llc 50 yep. 50 ownership yeah and, and that was important because i have tr obviously tried to do things in the past and you know when you get to that point where you're like hey you need to put up a certain amount of money and you see people dragging feet it's a really good indication that they're not bought in and so um this was great i mean we both quit our jobs like we both did everything that you need to actually dive in head first would and you invest in someone that had a, a side gig no exactly and would you no. Yeah, yeah, me neither. Or at least a path to making that full time quickly. Yeah, I, I don't think I'm ready to give up my money to someone, even if they have a path. Yeah. Right? Even yeah. if they have a path, I don't think I'm ready to give them my money. You can use your own money, you can find your family's money, but I'm not ready to give you my money yeah. unless you quit your job. Exactly. And that's, we funded it. Um, so I quit first and um, we were self funding it at that point. And then Jay quit. And as soon as he quit, that's when we went on the road for um, looking for some actual outside investment, like you mentioned. And we hadn't launched at the time either. We were raising money with private equity and venture yeah. capital before we had a product and before we had a name even. Um, wow. We were selling them on the concept and the team. And what was that raise, the size of your first raise? Uh, it was 1.3, about just over one was from an institutional and the other 250 or so was um, friends. Right, and just to be fair for entrepreneurs, right? Although you didn't have a product, you had a very established executive summary business plan, experience, yep. situational, credibility, emotional attachment, <laughs> quantitative reason, quantitative impact, and capabilities to get this done. Because there's no investors that are investing in just ideas other than family and friends, angel investment. Exactly. And I think the, I mean, I think attacking the total addressable market size was the one thing that people were looking for is, is this a big enough business where you can own, you know, 0.1% of the global market share and have a huge business. And um, so that's, I mean, that first checkbox that everyone was looking at. And now you guys are a multi-million dollar business. You're on a second raise? Or uh, uh, we're, look, we're raising our third now, third um, round. but we've done a second raise um, last February. And how big was that raise? That was just over five. So you, and you closed that one out. Exactly. Now how big's the third raise? Uh, we're really looking to scale, um, you know, 15, 20 million. Um, you know, obviously one, we're in a consumer business, so it's a capital intensive business from an inventory standpoint. Um, so just having a buffer to build inventory before peak seasons like holiday, et cetera. Um, but two, I mean, we have a lot of momentum on our side and just getting the name and word out there about Made In and what, we're, what we stand for and what we're um, all about. No, we, yeah. no we, I mean, we understand that it's sexy to get into direct to consumer digitally native brands now, and there's going to be a lot of action in the category now that we've proven it. Uh, so we really want to take advantage of the headway and, and raise some capital and really scale the business before kind of me too players can get involved. Right. And most people don't understand, you know, how that lineage, you guys are young and it's like, well, yeah, once we get this round, everything's going to be set, right? You close your first round, you're, especially, you know, first round being over a million dollars with where you were at, that's hugely successful. But then, you know, it just starts getting fun. And then you close your second round at $5 million and you're like, oh, yeah. Uh, you know, you're not driving Rolls Royces, flying around Boston, everywhere. There, every single stage, and it'll happen even after you, because I'm certain you'll close your third round. I'm interested in your third round. My friends are all interested in your third round. Even when you close that, then, you know, it's once again, okay, we're all in. <laughs> and there's nothing really coming either of your way as far as you know great success financial success yet is it is that true exactly and i think you know we say each, every time we close each round or each goal gets a little bit harder um so you know first it was you know the zero to ten million now you're looking at like the 10 to 100 million in, in revenue and for us like it's about building a team it's about getting the right people around us that can help us see through that but you know we're still working six seven days a week um you know it's not like we've raised these rounds and now it's time to take the foot off the gas it's actually the exact opposite let me change your i'm a big word guy as you know you guys listen to my yeah. stuff so yeah. don't ever say work anymore if i can give you a gift in your 20s like literally there's activity you get paid for an activity you don't get paid for i'm sure both of you would love to play quarterback for new england patriots and you would probably pay money if they let you do that so let's just drop the word work it creates resistance and voids and shortages you guys really love each other you love your business there's just activity you get paid for and at this time you're not getting paid a lot for your activity but everybody has seven days and 24 hours of activity right that's why i push people to learn about sleep because everybody's really good at that as far as doing it every day which is one of the only things but to get really good at it subconsciously and unconsciously would help so you know I, I think this is the most revealing part because everyone looks at you going oh my god they're in they've raised all this money which is like a dream for most guys your age let alone working with your best friend since you were five let alone you know the perfect complement of where you went and you guys were good students you know all these different things but i think it's important for them to know you're grinding 
Yeah. Right? You're in an activity you don't get paid for, really, comparatively what the company is, and you're all in. And that's the way Bezos was when he had an online bookstore. Right? That's how you get to $100 billion. That's how someday, yeah, you are flying all around the world and doing all the things. And you know, I've experienced this twice, and I really want to encourage you both you know, to share that story because there's young entrepreneurs that don't sacrifice everything. And yep. let me get to one thing. No, you guys have always been all in. You're highly and hyper competitive and successful. Great schools. You did really well at the schools, especially you can see more competitive nature and chip where he's like on top of your class. <laughs> this is what you do. You go to Wall Street. Yeah. I love that, right? <laughs> Meanwhile, like those schools rejected me. And now they pay me to speak. So it works for me. <laughs> I'm more like you, Jake, my dad's an entrepreneur. Figure it out. <laughs> exactly. Get but then again, I lost everything. So yeah, he's yeah, like, yeah. if I had a partner like Chip, I would have been fine. <laughs> He'd have been like, what are you doing? <laughs> um, anyway. How important do you think, right? It's very rare. You got like guys, you're, you guys are a huge success story already, but how important the world's changing over 50% of the people are going to be freelancers by 2027, right? Which is a huge opportunity for all of us. Right. How important is it to go to Cornell or Berkeley or Georgetown or, you know, the schools that we went to where our parents like made us feel like you're not going to be successful, doctor, lawyer, or failure. How important do you think today, if you were giving mentoring someone that has your entrepreneurial experience or, you know, for you engineering, you can learn online, you know, where's the line for you as far as going to those schools again, if you had it to do it over with? I mean, I think the importance is putting yourself in situations where you can learn faster and more efficiently, right? So if that happens by going to a certain school and puts you in that environment where you're forced to learn and absorb things quickly and in, in, in a good way, that's great. But to some people that might just be finding the right mentor, working for the right person, where you're put in these situations where you can get a lot of good information and a lot of good experience quickly so you can use it and move on. For me, um, you know, I think it, it's really important for, um, I guess, what we're doing. So basically, a good example of that is we have 12 people on our team. Um, we just hired two from uh, from. Clum uh, where did I go? Berkeley Business School. Yeah. Um, and what's important about, I was like, what did I do? Um, what's important about that is, you know, we have 12 slots right now as a team. We have limited cash to hire. Each each hire is ultra important at the stage we're at. And, you know, to hire two 12s from someone that you trust, people who you've worked with through multiple years at that school, de-risk that hiring process for us a lot. Um, we brought in a VP of Finance and a VP of Operations from Berkeley, who I immensely trusted and immediately offloaded a lot of stuff that was really valuable work from the company onto their plates because we knew exactly who they were, how hard they worked. Um, and I would not have had that if I think I was on an online school. Like I would not have had that past history with those with those employees. Perfect. So I'm going to ask you a quick few questions as we finish yeah. up. So where where's the line? You both think education is super important, but is there a financial line? How, how much should I invest if I have to go? Because there's no doubt. I don't think you would have raised your money if you didn't go to the schools you went to. Like I don't think you would have had the chance. I, I really, I don't. I think it's important for kids to know that, that you're in a different level. People, if you didn't have that credibility and you're out there with an idea, even though your family was in the business, it had been difficult to get a million three at the stage you're at. But because you had that background, where's the number for you if you're a parent going, all right, school's this much money, where do you say it's too much? What would be the amount? I mean, you're talking to a kid that hasn't committed to getting a dog yet, so I can put myself <laughs> in the position of parenting a kid going to college. Yeah. But no, I mean, with that said, I, I, I think that um, I think that the networks you build in schools, and in my opinion, I, I put more weight in, in where I went to high school than even college. I think the earlier you could build that network, Chip's talking about the better, and the better it prepares you for everything moving forward. So with that said, I mean, obviously it varies by parent, but I, I don't think there's many things more important than investing in education, so getting on the track. Can. Exactly. Chip? For me, I think it depends on the stage of education you're talking about. Um, when you're coming out of high school and going to college and then looking for that first job, um, everything is kind of a snowball effect in my eyes. And so when you look at like someone has to judge you on limited history when you're coming out of college, the only thing they really have to judge you on is the college that you came from, plus obviously some extracurriculars as you grow in your career. You know, I think when I was looking at business school, it was if I don't get into these X schools, I'm not going because it's not going to have an additional um, stamp of credibility on my record. I would have rather ha spent that time building more industry experience. So I think as you get more history behind you, um, then you can really pick and choose. Um, and that's when you know I wouldn't pay 100k or 120k to go to a you know really low ranked business school just for that credibility. Um, if it's in this certain echelon, um, then it makes sense if it can forward the career. Yeah, I think that's the most important lesson that you guys can share with people is, look, 
you know, there are anomalies, right? There's people that grow up and they don't need that head start, but it's harder, right? It, it's harder for them. And yes, there there's great people that, you know, I would say that have dropped out of Harvard, but then again, they got into Harvard. Yeah. And when they got into Harvard, you know, we know who these guys are, they're world legends. Um, they carried a big network of people to get into Harvard. You know, a lot of them went to those schools that you went to and have those relationships. And I agree, like my key relationship happened when I was five, one of my, my best friends, I just happened to grow up with, right? And, but building from there, uh, you know, I think it's important for people to do an analysis by understanding what they're investing in. You know, if you're gonna invest in a car, you do an analysis, if you're gonna invest in, in education. And I think you need to look at school as your biggest investment and you know where does the money roll out for you? Right. you know, how can you acquire the knowledge? There's two things you're acquiring: situational knowledge and relationship capital. And so I put a dollar value on that and, and analyze it. When kids ask me all the time, should I go to law school to be a sports agent? Should I go to college? I want to be an entrepreneur. Well, let's. What does that mean, right? Are you going to be going to you know some state school that no one's ever heard of, or are you going to Georgetown, Cornell, Berkeley? And what's that investment? And I can give you an ROI based on that. And I think we're being lazy when we're out there yelling at people, you don't need to go to college. Yeah. Look, I'm sending all my kids to college, right? But I've done an economic analysis. I've pushed them to be the people that they are, to get into the great schools, to do what they do. But in no way am I fooling myself that that's going to make them successful at a, being an entrepreneur, right? They, if, if I only wanted them to be an entrepreneur, then they should be sitting in here and learning from everything we do in here yeah. right. uh, and, and the people I get to meet, et cetera. But there's the experiential value of it as well because I'm hoping that both of you guys had a really good time when you were in college. <laughs> we did. <laughs> good. I went to one semester at Georgetown and it was, nice. I call it the Washington siesta. Yeah. But, I, <laughs> but I wasn't worried as much about my grades. <laughs> I also was almost homeless. Yeah. I went on the great potato fam and I bought a bag of potatoes and it had McDonald's ketchup if I couldn't convince someone to take me. And then I would also tell people, I had a homeless guy on the Tenley Town Metro. Nice. And I'd tell people when they were finished, can I take the left overs to him which i did i sat there and ate them with him yeah because i had i had 212 dollars for an entire semester wow. to go to it doesn't get you very far in georgetown no especially even back then right yeah. they got they had the metro yeah uh so they didn't have uber because i would have been through one night of uber <laughs> um, anyway you got to check these two guys out jake chip i'm not going to say the last names calic and, and malt we got it there Made in cookware. These guys are truly entrepreneurs and you got to not only check out their company, but check them out because I have a feeling that you're going to hear a lot about these two successful entrepreneurs here on Entrepreneurs, The Playbook.